Welcome to Chronicle of the Times. Death Houses and the Diabolical Surgeon. Today's episode looks at hospitals in the early half of the 1800s, colloquially described as death houses at the time. We also take a look at Robert Liston, the famous or infamous, depending on your view, surgeon, known for his surgical speed. Time me, gentlemen, time me. His speciality was amputations. We also take a quick look at two of Liston's famous pupils. Medical care in Regency England. A visit to the doctor was expensive and there was very little effective medicine available beyond alcohol, opium and bloodletting with leeches. Most medicine was herbal and came from apothecaries who made remedies and gave general health advice. Scientists were still developing their understanding of how the human body worked. Germs had yet to be identified, and antiseptics and antibiotics were unheard of. Growth of hospitals or death houses A number of London hospitals in the first half of the 19th century were rebuilt or extended in line with the demands placed upon them by the city's growing population. For instance, St. Thomas's Hospital received a new anatomical theatre and museum of specimens in 1813, and St. Bartholomew's Hospital underwent several structural improvements between 1822 and 1854 that increased the number of patients it could receive. Three new teaching hospitals were built in the city, including University College Hospital in 1834. However, most hospitals remain overcrowded, grimy and poorly managed. The assistant surgeon at St Thomas's was expected to examine more than 200 patients in a single day. The sick often languished in filth for long periods before they received medical attention. Wards had no facilities for washing hands or cleaning patients' wounds. The general medical knowledge of the time also believed pus was a natural part of the healing process rather than a sinister sign of sepsis. Many deaths were often due to post-operative infections. Smell. Hospitals reeked of urine, vomit and other bodily fluids. The smell was so offensive that the staff sometimes walked around with handkerchiefs pressed to their noses. Surgeons equally stank. Barclay Monaghan, one of the first surgeons in England to use rubber gloves, recalled how he and his colleagues used to throw off their own jackets when entering the operating theatre and don ancient frocks that were often stiff with dried blood and pus. They had belonged to retired members of staff and were worn as badges of honour by their proud successors, as were many other items of surgical clothing. As a result, surgeons carried with them the unmistakable smell of rotting flesh, which those in the profession cheerfully referred to as good old hospital stink. Fear. As well as the foul smells, fear permeated the atmosphere. The surgeon John Bell wrote that it was easy to imagine the mental anguish of the hospital patient awaiting surgery. He could hear regularly the cries of those under operation which he is preparing to undergo and see his fellow sufferer conveyed to that scene of trial, only to be carried back in solemnity and silence to his bed. Bedbugs Late Georgian and early Victorian hospitals lacked basic hygiene. A hospital's chief bug catcher whose job it was to rid the mattresses of lice was paid more than the surgeons at this time. 
bedbugs were so common that the bug destroyer, Andrew Cook, claimed to have cleared upwards of 20,000 beds of insects during the course of his career. Hospitals were breeding grounds for infection and provided only the most primitive facilities for the sick and dying, many of whom were housed on wards with little ventilation or access to clean water. As a result of this squalor, these places became known as houses of death. In this period, it was safer to have surgery at home than it was in a hospital, where mortality rates were three to five times higher than they were in domestic settings. Those who went under the knife did so as a last resort, and so were usually mortally ill. Few surgical patients recovered without incident. Surgery Undergoing major surgery in a grimy operating theatre without any form of anaesthetic was the norm of the time. That was the grim reality in the 1800s when the ruling theory was that damage from bad air was responsible for infections in surgical wounds. Hospitals simply aired out the surgical wards at midday to avoid the spread of infection. Surgeons took pride in wearing dirty, blood-stained operating gowns as a display of their experience in the surgical trenches. Surgery would be performed with no anaesthetic in dirty conditions. Patients often died from infection or shock. Surgeons amputated limbs in dirty, bad-lit rooms with no anaesthetic. In the early 19th century, surgeons, and even more so their patients, still faced the major problems which had been there for centuries. Pain, shock, lack of time, blood loss and infection. It was difficult to operate successfully on a conscious patient. Speed was essential, and a very good surgeon would amputate a leg in under three minutes. However, many patients still died from shock or loss of blood and even more from infection, after the operation. In some London hospitals, nine out of ten people died from infection. From this setting, we take a look at one of the most famous surgeons of the day, Robert Liston. About Robert Liston. Liston was born in Ecclesmachan in Scotland in 1794. Liston's father was a Scottish minister and inventor. Liston completed his medical education at the University of Edinburgh and then went on to join the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary to pursue surgery. However, Liston was an abrasive, arrogant man and difficult to work with. His reputation preceded him and he became exceptionally unpopular. Eventually, he moved to London, where he was appointed the position of Professor of Clinical Surgery at University College Hospital, London, in 1835. Here, he gained a considerable reputation and fortune. He became known as one of the foremost surgeons of his time, a position he was most definitely aware of. Robert Liston was an imposing man, standing six foot two inches, his strong, one could say cocky self-assurance, and abrasive personality ensured that few would have, have the temerity to argue with him. Liston was described, he was six foot two and operated in a bottle green coat with Wellington boots. He sprung across the bloodstained boards upon his swooning, sweating, and strapped down patient like a duelist, calling, Time me, gentlemen, time me, to students craning with pocket watches from the iron railing in the surgical galleries. Surgery and amputations. Patients were fully awake during the procedure, as anesthesia was not yet invented. The surgical procedure itself was terrifying. As such, Patients were known to flail, with some even trying to escape halfway through an amputation. 
Liston's known speed helped to secure his reputation and his fortune with long waiting lists. The speed of surgery was important in helping to minimise infection and death. Liston's own record for a leg amputation was a blazing 28 seconds. His usual speed was between two and a half to three minutes. Liston's Amputation Procedure Liston would stride into the room, removing his frock coat, put on a clean apron and wash his hands, a notable achievement for this era. He would then summon some poor, nervous medical student to hold the limb that was to be removed and another two students to hold the poor patient down. A typical amputation would take approximately two to three minutes to perform, with his fastest amputation being reported to be an astonishing 28 seconds. A handkerchief was then placed in the patient's mouth, with the good leg tied down to the table to prevent it getting in the way of Liston's flaying knife. The student holding the bad leg knew that if he flinched, lost his grip or bent the leg so that it snapped, he would experience the ire of Liston at the very least, or indeed himself be injured in the ensuing operation. Liston would then take approximately 30 seconds to cut through the flesh, saw off the bone and insert a few sutures, a record he was proud of. Liston had the students to time his operations and always attempted to better his previous performances. Liston would cut through flesh with a scalpel, saw through the bone and suture the wound. Everyone swore that the first flash of his knife was followed so swiftly by the rasp of saw on bone that sight and sound seemed simultaneous. Liston was known to clasp a bloody knife in his teeth whilst his own free hand sawed off the leg. The severed joint would be dropped into a bucket of sawdust. These procedures would be completed with an audience and were treated as a spectacle, with Robert Liston calling out, Time me, gentlemen! Two and a half minutes later, the amputation would be complete. Despite the speed with which he performed these procedures, his results were excellent for the time. Liston's results were better than the average at the time. Between 1835 and 1840, Liston performed 66 amputations, with only 10 dying. Conversely, the St. Bartholomew surgeon's mortality rate for the amputations during the same time was 25%. Though Liston had speed and success in his surgery, he preferred to reserve amputations as a last resort. In his book, Elements of Surgery, Liston wrote, Wider the extension of pathology, the fewer the operations will be, thus affording the best criterion of professional attainment. Who will question that there is more merit in saving one limb by superior skill than lopping off a thousand with the utmost dexterity? Some of Liston's well-known cases. In one case, Liston, in his need for speed, amputated not only the leg, but also the poor patient's testicles as well. In another famous case, Liston successfully removed a 45-pound tumour on the scrotum of a man in four minutes. Before the surgery, the patient had to carry this attached tumour in a wheelbarrow when walking. On yet another occasion, Liston's flying knife accidentally amputated his assistant's fingers in addition to the diseased limb. The outcome of this particular operation was horrific. The patient died of infection, as did the poor innocent assistant, while an observer died of shock. Liston's knife had slashed through his coattails and the poor terrified spectator though it must have pierced his vital organs. This case still remains the only operation on record in surgical history with a 300% mortality rate.
Students of Liston had a reputation of being in terror of him and would hide behind each other or bury themselves in the back row of the theatre arena to avoid being chosen to help during an amputation. One can understand why. Liston and the first use of ether in surgery. Robert Liston was recognised as being one of the first surgeons formally to use an anaesthetic in England. The use of ether was both a breakthrough and a potential death trap. The ether, in a surgery performed by gaslight, could ignite and cause a fire. Also, known side effects to the patient included vomiting and potential long-term lung issues. However, the use of ether was also a game-changer in terms of surgery, as we can see from this recounting of one of Lister's surgeries. On the 21st of December, 1846, a gentleman named Frederick underwent a lower limb amputation using a Yankee Dodge, as Liston called it. The name was derived from the American who discovered a use for ether within dentistry, William Morton. It was a term that Mr. Morton had used. The poor patient was petrified, but was given a rubber tube to hold in his mouth and told to breathe through it for two to three minutes. To the amazement of all watching, the patient soon became still. Liston was standing ready with his knife, and as soon as the patient was still, he took his standard 30 seconds to remove the limb without the patient moving at all. A few minutes later, the patient awoke and exclaimed, When are you going to begin? This was greeted by such laughter that the patient shouted out, Take me back! I can't have it done! Only when his amputated leg was held up for him to see did he accept that it was all over. The Yankee Dodge gentleman beats mesmerism hollow, declared Liston. The Yankee Dodge referred to was the invention of a Boston dentist, William Morton, who had been experimenting with ether for the extraction of teeth. This operation not only went down in history, but also had a lasting impact on two of Liston's students who were present at the time. Famous students of Robert Lister, James Simpson, father of chloroform. One of the students present at this first public use of ether was James Simpson. The son of a village baker, Simpson was 16 years old at the time he qualified at the age of 18 and eventually rose to the position of Professor of Midwifery at Edinburgh University. Having observed the use of ether for amputations, he started to wonder whether it would relieve the pain of childbirth, although he was worried about the impact of the ether on the fetus. He began experimenting with a multitude of chemical cocktails, then one day tried out, on himself, a new compound recommended by a Liverpool chemist. He woke up some time later on the floor. The chloroform had worked. Simpson made his fortune through the discovery. Joseph Lister, father of antiseptic. Another student under Robert Liston, who had witnessed the first use of anaesthetic, was one Joseph Lister. The development of surgery at this time had somewhat ground to a halt, and Lister was desperate to see an improvement in outcomes. By the second half of the 19th century, surgeons knew how to stop bleeding, anaesthetize their patients, and perform quite complex procedures, but the patients kept dying from infection. Lister was also a scientist, and his father had been a wine merchant with a great interest in microbiology. So Lister started to experiment. He found that when a bone of a frog was broken without the skin being breached, it healed, while a compound fracture that penetrated the skin became infected. Thus was started the development of antiseptic technique, an antisepsis that was to have such 
of profound impact on modern surgery, for which Lister himself was rightly given the credit. Listerine, a well-known mouthwash, is named after Robert Lister. Robert Liston. The quote of standing on the shoulders of giants could be applicable here with Liston's students. Liston's influence over his students was far-reaching. Robert Liston's operations were messy, bloody and traumatic, and his poor patients suffered terribly, but at least a fair proportion of them left hospital alive, which was more than could be said of most of his rivals at the time. Historically, his several accomplishments included one of the few to take off his frock coat and wash his hands and wear a surgical apron, which at the time was both unusual and significant. Liston invented a splint for supporting the thigh in case of dislocation. Liston was also the author of several publications and medical books, which were used for references in medical studies for years to come. Robert Liston's record of 300% mortality rate has yet to be beaten. Robert Liston eventually died on the 7th of December 1847 of an aneurysm at his home in London. You have been listening to Chronicle of the Times and I am Robin Coles.